The feud between Zambe and his nephew Nweka was momentous in the context of Kosa internal politics, especially because of how it would shape the fate of the Ahmad Kosa. How's it? I'm Dr. Jakob Seidner, and as always, this is my partner in all things history, Stashy, and you're watching The Historian Stash. Now, in this episode, we reach the epic conclusion of the feud between Nzambe and his nephew Nweka. For more than 20 years, Nzambe and Nweka were at each other's throats like the Tyrion and Joffrey Lannister of Kosaland. You're talking to a king! Ah, and now I've struck a king! Did my hand fall from my wrist? Nweka, eventually realizing that he was not as strong as he thought he was, collaborated with colonial forces bringing the Cape Colony into the mainstream of Amakosa politics. Nika's alliance with the Cape forced Ndrambe now to fight on two fronts. Finally, in October 1818, this rivalry would culminate with the epic battle of Amalinde. The battle was significant because it was the largest confrontation between the Amanzlambe and the Amanleka forces and so the winner would become the undisputed powerhouse of the Western Amakosa. Not only the people's champion, he's the undisputed champion. This was a war. Now, what makes this winner takes all grudge match even more dramatic is the speculation surrounding its leader. There are at least two theories for the causes of the battle. One theory is that one of Nzambe's sons abducted one of Nweka's concubines. And in a fit of rage, Nweka raised an army to attack Ndlambe. I'll attack him with the greatest force the world has ever seen. But this is not even the most intriguing theory. Indeed, there's another more popular narrative, one that involves the story of Tutula. Tutula was one of Ndlambe's wives and considered to be the Amakosa's version of Helen of Troy described as being famous for her exceeding beauty. I've heard rumors of your beauty. For once, the gossips were right. The Amazlambe alleged that Tutula was kidnapped by Nweka so that she could become his wife. But the implication was that Nweka would be committing incest because Tutula was, after all, his aunt. Therefore, many in the Amangweka camp found this narrative very offensive. I am offended. There's another story that describes how Tutula actually had a thing for Nweka as well. Aww. So the two lovebirds arranged that she would escape from Ndlambe's kraal to be with her lover, the young paramount chief. Ooh. This is a bit more romantic, but still doesn't detract from the fact that their relationship was, according to Kosa tradition, still incestuous. <laughs> now, alleged raunchy and dubious love triangles aside, we know that there was no love lost between Ndlambe and Nweka to begin with. But bruised egos weren't enough to go to war in Amakosa custom because of the very nature of the Amakosa leadership institution. Remember, chiefs and kings had merely limited power in Amakosa society. They could not make any impulsive decision on their own. So Nzambe's and Nika's counselors also had a say of whether or not they should go to war. While the Tutula affair could have played a part in hostilities, it's more likely that the main cause for open civil war 
was Nueka's meeting with the Cape Governor Charles Somerset, where he agreed to give up land between the Fish and Keskama rivers. Bribe. This apparently also angered King Hinsa, who saw how this could potentially undermine his own position on the throne. But he had also not forgotten about the time when Nueka had kidnapped him. Oh my lord. And then there was also Nueka's growing unpopularity among his own people. This is because Nueka supposedly implemented laws which sought to centralize his power at the expense of his own people. Okay. For one thing, he took over the homesteads of those heads of house who passed away without a direct heir. Yo. It's likely that a strategic mind such as Ndlambes would have decided to wait for a time when Nika was at his most vulnerable. <laughs> Absolutely. Therefore, the increasing unpopularity of Nika was the perfect opportunity for Ndlambe to strike. The exact site of the Battle of Amalinde is uncertain, but it's likely that it was somewhere in the Debe Valley. The old Iskosa word Ilinde or Umlinde means grave mound and or furrow. So Amalinde is the name given to a specific area covered by mounds. It's said that the Amalinde mounds and hollows are formed during the rainy season by these giant earthworms called microchitis. These worms build up the mounds as an escape hatch so that they don't get soaked when the rains come. Due to the inhospitable terrain caused by these mounds, it was thought that no one in their right mind would choose to fight there. Hey, don't tell me there's something wrong with me upstairs, you understand? But why you tell us something wrong with me upstairs? Because you tell me there's something wrong with me upstairs. At about noon on the day of the battle, Nika's warriors, led by his eldest son Makoma, arrived at the battlefield and met Ndrambe's forces, commanded by his son Ndushane. The Amangneka were inspired by their diviner Ntsakana, who had first offered his services to Ndrambe, but Makanda Nere was already occupying that position. And Sakana, along with his new boss, was confident that his visionary expertise would help defeat the man who had rejected him in the first place. So Nika's men, brimming with confidence, attacked Ndrambe's men and a vicious battle ensued. The Amang Nika were gaining the upper hand and Nika, watching from a nearby hill, was ready to pop the champagne and reward his men with victory bonuses. However, what he did not know was, it was all a trap. It's a trap! You see, Nzambe, along with his ally King Hinsa, had chosen the field of battle, apparently because of distance. It was much further to march from Nika's great place than from Nzambe's place, so his men would be much fresher than the Amangneka. Another plot twist was that he and Hinsa had only sent a fraction of their force to meet Nika's warriors. This fraction was called the Inkakuva, the young and inexperienced warriors. Meanwhile, Nzambe kept the older and more experienced men, the Amafan and Kosi, hidden from view. Once the Amangneka were out on their feet, Nzambe unleashed the Amafan and Kosi as the knockout blow on either side of Nika's men. It's unknown how many warriors were killed during the battle, but what is known is that it was particularly brutal. Usually, according to Amakosa custom, the victorious warriors would rip open the stomach of the killed and release their spirits. Otherwise, they would seek revenge on those who had killed them. But according to reports, the Amanzlambe packed the bodies of Nika's fallen on top of one another and set them alight. What's wrong with you? In the end, while Nzambe achieved a stunning victory over his nephew, his celebration would be short-lived. Nika, in his panic, ran to the British colonial authorities for help and they responded by sending Colonel Thomas Brereton out with a significant force that joined Nika's men in attacking Nzambe. By then, Hinsa had withdrawn back across the Kai River, so Nzambe did not have his ally anymore. Brereton's force destroyed Nzambe's kraals and seized approximately 23,000 heads of cattle. Once Brereton had accumulated about as much cattle as his men could seize, he withdrew his army back to Grahamstown. One of Ndrambe's advisors would say, You sent a commando, you took our last cow, you left only a few calves which died for want. Without milk, our corn destroyed, we saw our wives and children perish. We saw we must ourselves perish. We followed, therefore, 
the tracks of our cattle, into the colony. The deeds of the colonists could no longer go unpunished. A large-scale action was needed, and so Ndrambe sanctioned Makandangere and Umdushane to attack Grahamstown, to retrieve the stolen cattle and take out Nika's most powerful ally. But, as we know, the attack on Grahamstown failed. Nine years later, in 1828, the legendary old chief Nzalambe died. In his lifetime, he had fought just about everyone and had also tried to make friends with everyone. But whether he was fighting or loving, he ultimately could not stop the inevitable expansion of the colonial machine. In his own way, he tried to do what was best for his people, and whether or not that was the correct way, it is up for debate. Even in death, he inspired other Amakosa leaders to continue their resistance in the wars of dispossession that would follow. Even today, though there aren't any pictures of him, at least none what I could find, he is remembered by his own people as a heroic figure. Nika died a year after his uncle, and between the two of them, history has been kinder to Ndrambe. Nika is largely remembered as a jealous, unstable chief who was quick to lay claim to the Amakosa throne but did not possess the noble qualities attributed to Ndrambe. However, his legacy was saved in a way by his descendants, such as Makoma and Sandire, who became revered by their people for their leadership in the face of the colonial onslaught. These men deserve their own episodes, so rest assured that these are on the way, as well as the tragic but heroic life of King Hinsa, who met his end in the most controversial way. Until next time, have a lacquer one, and as always, stay stashed.